Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's forum. Please welcome University Chaplain and Vice President for Social Equity and Community, Chaz Howard. Thank you, everybody, for joining us for the inaugural University Forum on Equity and Community, Truth Telling, the Media, and Social Equity. I'd be remiss if we didn't begin uh, from a place of gratitude to everybody who's made this afternoon possible, especially everyone who's been behind the scenes, our partners in VPUL and the president's office, all the people who've made this work tech-wise from higher IT, uh, our, our great colleagues, Mark Bendis, and especially Mercedes Lee in our office, who've worked really hard uh, to make this, this, this day come off without a hitch. Thank you so much. Uh, you are in for a treat. You're going to hear from some of the best of our Penn alumni, you can hear from one of our Penn trustees. You're gonna hear from a Penn Dean and the current Penn student. You all make us very proud. We're deeply grateful to you. I wanted to just offer a quick word about the past, the future, and the present before we get into, uh, get into the event. Today would have been my father's 100th birthday. And I think he'd really enjoy this conversation. When he was a teenager, he and his brothers founded a newspaper in Des Moines, Iowa called the Iowa Observer because they felt that the white owned and white managed papers weren't capturing the experience and the stories of the small black community there in Des Moines, Iowa. He later enlisted in World War II and he wrote for the Army Times and he wrote about segregation in our armed forces bravely. A couple of generations later, his granddaughter, uh, now my daughter, Carissa, has an interest in pursuing journalism as a field. Uh, and last year, I reached out to Penn trustee, Andrea Mitchell about this. And, and Ms. Mitchell invited Carissa down to watch her record down there at NBC studios there in DC. And she watched an episode of Andrea Mitchell reports and was, was, was so moved by the way that uh, she was engaging other colleagues, other journalists and leaders in our times, pushing them to tell the truth. And so with the past and the future, I'm so excited that we get to engage contemporary journalists, contemporary thought leaders around this intersection of truth-telling and journalism and social equity. But before turning it over to our panel, uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce somebody who, who I think needs no introduction here. Last summer, our university president, Dr. Amy Gutman, shared with me her vision for establishing a new office of social equity and community here on campus to help us as a university and as a community wade into the difficult conversations around inequities and injustice and how Penn might work to alleviate them. Among the things that she charged us with was building this very event right here. In 2018, Fortune Magazine named Dr. Gutman one of the 50 greatest leaders in the world, an honor that I think is most fitting, not just because of the way that she's led our university over her tenure and the way she's led our university during this most difficult year, but because of what she does every single day. The big thing she does around pushing back on inequities, around making Penn more accessible and more affordable, the things she's done to push us to engage our neighbors and to, to be a responsible citizen here in Philadelphia and in our country. And the things that other people may not see, the way that she has protested with and locked arms with our students who are speaking out against racism and other forms of discrimination too. So I truly do think she's one of the great leaders in our world. And it's an honor to call her a colleague, my boss and friend. It's my joy to introduce to you, President Amy Gutman. Chaz, thank you so much. Thank you so much and welcome, welcome everybody. Today's inaugural university forum uh, that is put on by our wonderful Office of Social Equity and Community. It actually reflects, I was thinking about this, two very salient features of our shared commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, Penn has both a very high ceiling of aspirations, never mission accomplished, and a very deep well of talent and support. And these two features, the high ceiling and the deep well, embody all the good work in our new Office of Social Equity and Community. 
The high ceiling is manifest in signature programs like Projects for Progress, which Chaz has launched this spring semester. And this program supports bold new efforts of the Penn community to make us more equitable. And we're seeding equity in action programs by Penn students and staff and faculty all working together to build a better future for our university, our community, and our world. And today's university forum is also a high ceiling effort. It's about telling truth and truthful stories through the media and too often the failure to do so and how that aids or impedes progress towards a more just and equitable society and world. So we need more and more of these conversations like the one we're about to have today, not only here at Penn, but also across our entire society and the world. So the political philosopher within me is thrilled to welcome these conversations. So is the democratic citizen in me. I'm confident of our high aspirations for success because thanks to Chaz and all the people who share this avid commitment to advancing inclusion, pursuing social equity and eradicating racial injustice, thanks to that just shared commitment, which we want to spread far and wide, we at Penn can also draw from a very deep well of talent and support. And we take joy in that solidarity and the incredible talent and support that spans our institution, our friends and supporters. So I'm, I'm not here to introduce our panelists, they're all honored members of our Penn community, but I do want to welcome and thank David Friedlander, John Jackson, Andrea Mitchell, Kayla Padilla, and Jamil Smith. On behalf of all of Penn, I salute each of you for the important work you perform in your daily lives in promoting a society that is more open to both hard-hitting evidence and empathetic storytelling and is committed to the struggle to becoming more equitable and inclusive. You fight the good fight, you do the good work, and our community is tremendously proud to name you as our own. So as long as I'm naming names, I wanna call out as well the incredible talent, um, the team that Chaz has assembled for today and every day in this effort. Co-directors of our Office of Social Equity and Community, Scott Elkin, Scott, excuse me, Scott Filkin, and Nicole Malloy, Office Administrator Coordinator Mercedes Lee, and moderating this afternoon's panel, the Vice Provost of University Life, Chief of Staff, and Chief Communications Officer, Monica Yant Kinney. The well of talent is very deep indeed. Our aspirations for breaking all glass ceilings correspondingly high. So my thanks and appreciation go to each and every one of you. This af afternoon's discussion is going to be engaging, provocative, timely, and important for all of us. So I'm confident we'll be successful knowing that the ceiling of our aspiration is high and the wellspring of our commitment is deep. So Monica, let's get going. Thank you all and take it away, Monica. Thank you so much, Dr. Gutman. Uh, welcome to everyone tuning in uh, across the globe, and that includes my mom and dad in Indiana. Hi, uh, I am Monica Ann Kinney. I'm so fortunate to work at Penn after a long career in journalism at the Philadelphia Inquirer. Uh, I'm gonna take a few minutes just to very briefly introduce this incredible panel, and then uh, we'll begin our conversation. Um, Andrea Mitchell is a 1967 Penn alumnus, a trustee emerita, and, and a media legend. She serves as NBC News Chief Foreign Affairs Correspondent, and she hosts Andrea Mitchell Reports on MSNBC. We are incredibly lucky to have Andrea with us here today, and I think through the magic of technology, she will pop onto the screen. Um, uh, Dr. John L. Jackson Jr. is the Walter H. Annenberg Dean of the Annenberg School for Communication and the Richard Perry University Professor. He's a brilliant filmmaker and scholar with expertise in urban anthropology, mass media, and critical race theory. Dean Jackson. 
There he is. Uh, Jamil Smith is a 1997 alumnus, an Emmy Award winning producer, and a senior writer for Rolling Stone. If you are not already one of his 312,000 Twitter followers, you should be. Jamil? David Freelander graduated from Penn in 2000. He writes for New York Magazine, and he has a book coming out this month with a terrific and timely title, The AOC Generation, How Millennials Are Seizing Power and Rewriting the Rules of American Politics. David? And speaking of the future, I am delighted to introduce Kayla Padilla. She's Wharton class of 2023. She's the Ivy League's 2020 Women's Basketball Rookie of the Year. And in her spare time, Kayla founded, writes for, and edits the Sideline Post, an online media platform for college athletes. Kayla? Great, we are all here. So what I'm gonna to try to do is throw one question out to sort of each of you individually to sort of set the stage for today and then try to get the conversation going through, through our Brady Bunch boxes. Um, Andrea, we've talked about this before. You started your career as a female copy boy at KYW in Philadelphia. Can you just set the stage for us a little bit with some thoughts about newsroom diversity then and now? I mean, you really have seen, seen it all. Well, over these years, thank you so much, Monica. And I am so pleased to be with my fellow panelists, uh, such a wonderful group that you and Chaz have pulled together today and under of course, the, the leadership of Amy Gutman uh, as a proud Penn alum. But as I got out of school, um, I was planning to go to graduate school and then you know, the bug bit me. Uh, I didn't get the fellowship that I wanted. I got into a school you know, into Cambridge in England and uh, but not the fellowship that I had applied for. So decided to just take this flying leap into what I thought was going to be, you know, broadcast journalism wide open and had been accepted into the management trainee program there. And then they told me, but you can't be in the newsroom because we can't have women in the newsroom. It's 1967. We could not have a woman in the newsroom because that would somehow be unsettling. So, um, I talked them into letting me be the copy boy on the midnight to eight shift so that barely anyone would see me and um, took that job instead of a management training job and have over the years witnessed this change. You know, news then was very, um, uh, well, let's just say there were three networks, three networks, no cable, uh, no podcasts. <laughs> there was all news radio, and that's what KW Radio was where I was starting. Uh, so there were, was a lot of fact based journalism, very little opinion journalism. But whose facts were they? They were white male facts. And um, eventually there were a few women, a handful of women. And when I then moved on to Washington, found my fellow women, Judy Woodruff, Koki Roberts, you know the great women from NPR along the campaign trail as I became a national reporter eventually, but there were very, very few people of color and there was very little gender diversity in terms of LGBTQ. Uh, people were very closeted. It was a completely different world. And with that comes, I think the lack of opinion and uh, of not just opinion, but, but of the editorial selection, the subjective decisions that are made every day in newsrooms around the world and here in the United States, what is news? And if news is defined by what white men think is news, then women's issues and issues of color and of, you know, and think of the context also. I started in the 60s, the Vietnam War, the civil rights movement, uh, then the women's movement, all of these things began to evolve and how did they get covered? Uh, you know, one of my first experiences a year after graduation was covering the uh, the outburst in Philadelphia after Dr. King's assassination. How did that get covered? So when you think back, um, what we have now is a very different environment of a multitude of platforms and much more diversity. Not great, but moving towards real inclusion. But what we now have is, um, I would say, facts being 
um, more diverse, but also opinion dominating sure. what I would call hard news reporting. And we have not found that balance. And that's with the advent of talk radio and then cable news, and then cable news becoming you know, fractured into the left wing and the right wing and somebody in the center and going with political winds and catering to political trends. So I think we have a major crisis right now in journalism where people go into their own niches and don't find real you know, hard news journalism and still are not as diverse as we need to be in terms of the decision-making before and uh, in front of and behind the cameras and certainly in the executive uh, offices where these big decisions mm -hmm. are. Well, and that, that sets up the question that I would love to hear from uh, an answer from Dean Jackson. I mean, we're here to explore the concept of truth telling. What are the odds that, that everyone in our audience today or even everyone on this panel has the same definition of truth? Does it look and feel and sound the same to all of us? And if not, what is the impact of that? Thank you for um, the question. And it's so great to be here on this panel. I look forward to learning a lot. Um, I guess I would start to answer that question by saying there's a version of how we live every day that's predicated on this um, myth we tell ourselves, which is that all of the terms that we take for granted, all of the things we think we can define quite easily are settled concepts. But one thing that's becoming increasingly clear and not just in a hyper political and partisan way, but more generally is that every single one of the ideas, the concepts, the themes that we bandy about, like we, you know, like we all know what they are in some self-evidential way are constantly open to debate and challenge. And so when I think about the question of, of truth telling, when I think about what we mean by fact, when we tie that all up to a discussion we're trying to have about social equity, I think, the two things that jump out to me are that we have to begin with a conversation and think about what we, two, two things that start with E. One is evidence. So often to understand what people think they mean by truth, by fact, um, some claims they wanna make about the world and how we should live in it together. It's often predicated on what they imagine to be the evidentiary ground they stand on to make that claim. So we should think about how we mobilize evidence because that often undergirds the assumptions we have about what is true and what is false, what's fact and what's mere opinion. And we like to make a kind of hard and fast distinction, I think, between pontificating and opinionizing and, and, and standing on the solid ground of fact. But we realize most of what we think about as fact is still constituted, at least in part, by the stories we tell ourselves and the evidence we use to support it. So I think one is like, Let's talk a little bit more as a society about how we come to have expectations about evidence, what we take for granted and why, what we think about is even self-evidential and on what grounds we make those kinds of claims. And then I think the second part of it is a version of kind of what our ethics are. So, so the answer often to the questions about truth, um, about what we even think we mean by equity, diversity, it, it's kind of rolling out of what we imagine we, think the world should be and the kinds of claims we make moral and ethical about what the life of the good life or, or a kind of just beloved community or society should entail. And so I think it's trying to think explicitly about evidence and how we mobilize it and what our own individual ethics are, what we believe, what we think should be the world we all occupy as kind of behind the scenes what really supports the kind of claims we make about the world we live in. And I think if we spent more time, both sort of as professionals, but also in our everyday lives, actually talking explicitly about those two ideas, I think it'll help us to understand some of the conflict, some of the distances between and among us in terms of the opinions we have about the world we live in and what we imagine we want the world to look like in the future. Well, Jamil, geez, uh, that, that's probably a difficult task in a normal environment, but in the last year, uh, a pandemic has, has radically altered how we, how we live, how we seek the truth, how we do our jobs. Um, you're out there every day trying to do what Dean Jackson is talking about. Can you talk a little bit about how COVID has, has thrown us for yet another loop? Well, I think it's made us more insular. And I think, you know, to, to Andrea's point, 
you know, there is a crisis going on right now in our in our business, and frankly, the product that we produce. Uh, you know, when you hear phrases like alternative facts and fake news, I mean, that's the kind of stuff that, you know, evokes newspeak from Orwell's 1984. But it also evokes what, you know, people in power have really always tried to do, which is to, at some level, avoid a measure of accountability, whether total or a part. And they've also, uh, you know, in this case, especially with this past administration, um, sought to limit critical thinking by those who might in fact do you know you know the accounting so i think what it is important that we do as a society uh is to understand the role of the press and i think frankly that still is a problem uh you know on a, on a broader level i think people don't really truly understand what we do um and they don't understand the diversity of roles within the press uh i'm a columnist for instance so i'm able to, you know, talk about my opinion uh, freely, you know, with regards to past administration, this administration, what have you. But yes, I mean, there is a role for what I do. There's a role for what you know, others who, you know, have to present objective facts do, but we all are in the business of collecting evidence, like Dean said. And we are trying to make sure that that evidence is presented to our readers to our audiences in, in, in whatever mediums that we're that we're on and try to help people understand that they are the ones who then have to take that evidence and do the accounting and we have to inspire at least you know uh, on, a, on a very base level people to start to be invest you know investigators themselves to question authority to do the very kinds of things that people in power don't want them to do and so that is what I see uh, I know my role as, and I think that, you know, that applies to people who, you know, have opinions and who don't have opinions in journalism. Well, so I turn to David because you've just spent a considerable amount of time thinking about these issues through the lens of, of youth and a generation. Can you, can you link this conversation to what you have ascertained about how millennials consume the news, disrupt the news, critique the news, um, what, how is this landing with them? Yeah, I mean, I think I was sort of inspired in a way um, to write that book by watching this sort of generation come into politics and political organizing in this time of all of these kind of distractions that we're all dealing with. I mean, I think everybody here probably has like a full Netflix queue and, you know, getting out of their homes, getting off their couches and going and organizing and talking to people and doing something that wasn't just sort of tweeting through it or even marching through it, but, you know, registering voters, knocking on doors, uh, getting together and convincing people in a way that's kind of the most basic, you know, fundamental, like basic building block of our democracy. Um, you know, I, 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 I think now we're in this situation where, you know, all of us can sort of do our jobs to the extent that we have sort of been trained how to do them. But I'm not sure how well it's kind of like connecting with the rest of the world out there. And I'm not quite sure what we can all do about that. I mean, you know, this is an incredible uh, profession. It, it really is. But like when you see people storming the US Capitol, saying things that they learned on their Facebook feed that none of us have said have any basis in truth, right? But but as um, Professor Jackson was saying earlier, I mean, they're not, they're not like inventing that thing in a way that's like, they, they're not, they're not just scribbling it down on a whiteboard, right? I mean, they're constructing an argument based on evidence that is not coming from us, that is no factual basis, but it's still there. And then we have these outcomes that are just kind of catastrophic. Um, and I, you know, I, I'm not sure, I'm not sure where that really leaves us. Well, and it's it's intriguing to me, Kayla. I mean, at, at a time when traditional media is in dire straits, uh, where readership and engagement is a constant challenge, you launched your own media platform. W what was behind that decision? Uh, what void are you trying to fill? Sure. I uh, just want to first start off by saying how honored I am to be on this panel and amongst this great group of people. But to answer your question, um, I've been an athlete for most of my life. I've been able to really deeply understand and become familiar with the athletic landscape. 
And I think especially, you know, being a sophomore in college now and kind of getting a taste for what the college athletics life is, I've come to discover that there are very few representatives of the college athlete voice. And usually that voice is designated to players who come from more high profile programs with just more access to media exposure. And I think that in itself creates a sort of hierarchy within college athletics where who you play for and the program you play for kind of equates your ability to be heard. So I think the sideline post kind of birthed to dismantle the notions and to put it simply, we pride ourselves on kind of the basis that we don't care if you're the next NBA draft pick or if you're a bench warmer at a junior college, your voice and your story is of equal magnitude and worth. And so what I've come to learn from running the sideline post for almost about a year now is that the younger generation, especially the college demographic, is really cognizant of the voice we have and, and the power it possesses, but the degree to which it's amplified is where it varies. So here at the Sideline Post, we're not introducing, you know, our writers to a voice that they suddenly are able to discover, but we're more so helping them recognize the fact that, yes, you have a voice, and not only do you have a voice, but that voice matters and your story is worth sharing. So it's been a very valuable and uh, fulfilling experience, to say the least. And who knows, we may have somebody uh, watching today that gets really excited about monetizing this product for you. Uh, so now I'll, I'll, I'll throw some questions out that hopefully we can get a nice uh, back and forth between, between everyone on the, on the panel. Um, uh, Andrea Jamil and, and David in particular, I mean, you cover national government, you cover politics. Uh, tell our audience a little bit about what the last few years are like. Did you ever imagine that you would be doing your job, your, your, your chosen and cherished career at a time when you would be dubbed enemies of the state? Have, have you felt fearful uh, in, your, in your travels? What is it like to encounter this sort of increasing hostility and, and skepticism when you are out doing, as Dean Jackson says, searching for that evidence to bring the truth to people? Well, I can just say um, from covering the campaign that I had never, absolutely never, I've covered every president since Jimmy Carter and Ronald Reagan, you know, full time in the White House for those eight years. And then um, the Hill and back in the White House with Bill Clinton and the State Department since 94 and traveled the world. And I'd never thought here in the United States I would see that kind of rhetoric from the White House, would see, frankly, White House press secretaries. And um, when we did have briefings, which were rare and, and far between at the State Department or the Pentagon, which had been regular and now again are daily events, but uh, were basically abandoned. But from the White House podium to see, um, and that's where alternative facts was actually coined, you know, by Kellyanne uh, Conway. Um, on Meet the Press <laughs> and um, to see press spokesmen and women really defiling the podium and the place of the White House. I always felt when I was covering the White House full time, you walk through those gates and you realize that you have this um, privilege of representing the American people. You get to go through the gates. You've got, you know, you've been checked and you've got your pass, but you walk through those gates and you then get to witness the world. You go to summits, you go to briefings, you travel, you know, you cover the Iraq war and the Afghanistan, you go into conflict zones. And, and as you are communicating to the American people and to the world, what their government is telling them and trying to um, fact check as you go and put it in context and do all the rest, you think that the reason you have this position and I have that moment in history and watch these summits and watch arms control agreements be negotiated or, or disavowed, you have this privilege as a representative of millions of people and to be lied to and then accused of being the enemy of the people and to have the platform, um, as I say, defiled by lies day in and day out was just um, mind bending. And it has to be called out, but I was placed in a position as someone who would always, you know, 
called things out, but felt that I was reporting and analyzing, but not having to come on the air and say, well, the president said this today and that is a lie. You know, I don't, I wanna be adversarial, properly adversarial and challenging, but I don't want to become uh, an opponent because that's not the role. I'm not an opinion writer. I'm not a columnist. I don't have the privilege that Jamil has to express opinions. And I have been for the last four years placed in the position of being categorized in a way that makes me very uncomfortable as a journalist because there were so many things that were wrong at the State Department and in other you know, pronouncements that had to be challenged. The firing of the inspectors general, you know, all sorts of institutional changes, the hollowing out of the State Department, the, um, the firing of people, the impeachment testimony. And you don't want to be put in one corner or another. I've always had a program where Republicans were as welcome as Democrats or anyone in between. And it reach, has reached a point in Washington where you either work for one network or another and you are then viewed as the enemy or a friend. And I don't wanna be anyone's friend either. I'm a journalist, you know, it, and speaking, you know, very broadly. So that has, I think, made it much harder my colleagues have been placed in physical danger and we had to get security for some of the people covering the Trump rallies because he would call people out by name from the podium. They were in a press pen and people would start turning on them and this in open carry states in huge rallies with 20, 30,000 people in football stadiums. Mm -hmm. So there was real danger there. Um, but I never thought in the United States of America, I would feel as I have felt in places like you know, hostile zones, North Korea, uh, places where I've been arrested and, you know, Syria under Assad, other places. I've never thought that I would feel that in this country. And oh. certainly what happened on January 6th was terrifying. Not personally, I wasn't there, I was two blocks away, but to my colleagues who were in the chamber as pool reporters, on the ground with the members, terrifying and unconscionable. Jamil, David, do you have some experiences or thoughts? Yeah, um, you know, I think I could speak a little bit to what Andrew was talking about in terms of the danger. Um, you know, I know certainly a number of my, you know, colleagues throughout the business have, you know, faced, you know, physical threats. Um, and I know I've uh, also, you know, dealt with that on a personal level. Uh, I remember being on the convention floor in 2016 in my hometown and uh, Cleveland, Ohio, watching the Republican National Convention and having people, you know, shout shame at the press. And, you know, people who I was having regular conversations with moments before, and then all of a sudden it just kind of gets swept up in this wave of hatred and, 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 and animus. It's, it's really, really, um, upsetting, but it is a symptom of what I was talking about before. When you shut off, you know, when you encourage people to shut off their critical thinking and you tell them that, you know, you know the press is the enemy, the people, I mean, I, I mean, people have thought the press is the enemy before, but we didn't hear it coming from the president of the United States. And that's, that's the difference. And he knew that. And so while I'm not on anybody's team, I'm actually really, as an immune as an opinion writer, not really trying to be opposing anyone. I'm trying to, you know, I'm trying to just tell the truth the best way that I know how. And I have an opinion and I have an argument, but I'm not trying to say to someone, you should do this. I mean, if I were, wanted to get in the advice game, I could become a political consultant. You know, I could work for someone's campaign, but that's not what I want to do. And I tell uh, candidates and elected officials all the time, I'm not on your team. I'm here to push you to, to make you better or to be more accountable, what have you. And that's, Honestly, what I feel like our role, no matter who, you know, what space we fill in this, in this business, that's the role that we should be filling. And it's unfortunate, frankly, that because of the marketplace of media, I think to some degree, and I've been a part of it because I was a producer at MSNBC for years. Um, and I think that speaking to what Andrew was also mentioning earlier, we have, you know, kind of siloed opinion, you know, and, and takes, you know, two different 
uh, to ne different networks and different outlets. And I know, you know, we're guilty of that at Rolling Stone. And I think that it's uh, frankly an unfortunate happening within our, within our business. So we need to help people encourage to seek out, uh, you know, intellectually honest opinions uh, from every side. And it's, it's been difficult to have, in, you know, people thinking in that particular fashion when they go and make their choices about what media they're going to consume. Yeah, so you know, my I, I remember I was on the the like Mitt Romney campaign plane in 2012 as they you know flew around the country and stopped everywhere and did rallies and everything, and like that was really normal. You know, I mean, you would stop places, you could like talk to the people who would be at the rally, you could talk to the candidate and his consultants, um, and you could like talk about their strategy, and they knew that the press is probably opposed to them, and you know probably a bunch of coastal liberals, but it was all like a very kind of normal interaction in a way that is just seems impossible now. I mean, when I go to, you go to Trump rallies or you go to even to like a sort of democratic socialist event, like nobody, I mean, they really avoid talking to people like me now uh, from, from, from both sides, you know, uh, for the fear that we're like not on their side and they can find someone else on their side who will go, who, who they can who they can talk to um you know i and, and i can't it's it, it sort of has trickled down i mean it, it is like it's hard i'm a magazine writer i write for new york magazine and political magazine and, and vanity fair and places like that like it's hard now for to get republicans to talk to me um republican politicians i'm talking about i mean they just won't do it they just don't feel that it's in their interest and they don't feel an obligation to do it and they don't feel they'll be treated fairly and they have their own places to go and, and their readers aren't reading what i'm writing about so you know why bother anyway um and it's a, it's a, it's hard to know where all of this is is going to go i mean i think that to what andrew was saying earlier i mean we we just all live through a thing which was i think frankly like i mean at least in 100 years or so like our first really illiberal president who did not believe in uh, a free and open press, who did not believe in inspectors general and, and would do these things like talk about the press, the any of the people and this kind of thing. And it put the press in the situation of being a kind of central character in the national drama in a way that we're not often, and we're not certainly not supposed to be. Um, and I, I sort of just say that as like observation, I don't really know what we are supposed to do about that, um, that situation. I mean, it seems like maybe it's kind of over and I think we could sort of handled it as best we could under the circumstances, but it's been, it's been like a very odd thing to kind of live through for the past few years. Yeah. Well, and I, and I, this takes me back to, to Jean Jackson. I mean, people have, have made light of concepts like fake news and alternative facts. And it's easy to see how those become part of an SNL skit or, or someone's monologue. But, but what are the serious ramifications of, of a populace actually believing that the news is fake? What, is this, what are the ramifications? What's the impact of, of a concept like alternative facts being in the, the daily conversation in a democracy? One clear and I think dangerous implication of all this is the inability to have a conversation. Indeed, the inability to have a community if folks aren't sharing some of the most basic fundamental ideas about what the world is that we're inhabiting together. So I think, and, and, and that isn't, I mean, there's a version of this that's political, but even more than that, it's almost existential because ultimately if it really is true that we can't communicate across the chasm of the differences of opinions we have about what we imagine facts to entail, then nothing else is possible, right? That there's so much about our cultural apparatus, the world in which we, we mutually construct um, our existence together, that really is a function of us being able to at least agree on some of the basic building blocks, the fundamental ideas that we use to prop up the social community, the social contract as folks still sometimes call it. And so I think that's a version of what's at stake in this conversation because ultimately 
clearly, you know, we can have a lot of, uh, and, and it's easy to be dismissive about folks who believe what we think to be maybe cockamamie ideas about the world. But trust me, we're all cultural animals and we all believe cockamamie things. Like some of it might feel like, you know, it has the weight of the world hangs in the balance. Some of it might seem relatively inconsequential, but we're all similarly irrational in, in certain kinds of ways. That's not what the problem is. I think there's a version of what we have to figure out is, is how do we find a way to create a public sphere that is actually able to facilitate us being able to separate out our own irrationalities and flights of fancy from the clear, hard, and difficult work of continuing to build a democracy, a community, a collectivity together that we all benefit from. And so I think if we can't find the language to do that together, it becomes, then, then what happens is we find the language that we build with the folks who speak the, in the terms that we already agree on. And then we create the siloed and really difficult to coordinate set of different communities. And often as we see in our current political moment, communities that are at loggerheads in ways that can be really, really profoundly troubled. Wow. Well, Kayla, this is the part where I ask you to sort of speak on behalf of uh, an entire generation. Um, I, I am so curious, and I'm sure our audience is curious, how do you and your friends access, consume, and discuss media? I, I'd love to hear a bit about how you even, what you define as news, what do you read, do you listen to, do you pay for anything? That's the question I always want to know for, from young people too. Do you see news as something that, that, is, that has a, a value uh, that is worth, worth your money in the same way, or do you believe that it should just be coming to you uh, from, you know, for free? Right. Uh, well, to first kind of answer your question about how I think a majority of, you know, the younger generation college demographic consumes media, I would have to go with the pretty generic answer of social media. I think especially within these past few turbulent months with the rise of several social injustice issues, the election, all with the underlying issues of the pandemic, there was just a lot of things we couldn't do. So a lot of people took to social media as a form of protest or showcasing their acti activism, just because we couldn't go outside and normally kind of showcase that public publicly and visibly. So I think social media in the sense of, you know, these past few months had become more prevalent than ever in the sense that it's maybe no longer just talking about Instagram specifically, just what you showcasing your hobbies, showcasing what you're eating or who you're with, but more so an extension of yourself and what you believe in and your viewpoints. And so I think within these past few months, a lot of people have just been very outspoken about their beliefs and their viewpoints, political affiliations, um, almost to the point where I feel like there was a lot of pressure to fall in line and do the same, because if you didn't, it seemed as if you were indifferent to all these issues. And I think, kind of tricky thing during this whole time was that silence in some manner equated to indifference. Um, and that's hard because you don't really know the intentions of someone's silence, whether that's, um, you know, intentional and, you know, at risk of losing good allies just because someone isn't as loud or as engaged as, you know, what they should be. But in terms of your other question regarding if we do pay for news, um, I actually took a poll on my Instagram last night, more to the power of social media, if you know people are willing to pay for news. Um, and a majority of people said that they're not. I think it's more so due to you know the fact that there are just so many free resources at our fingertips. And second, we're college students, we need any penny we can get, truthfully. Um, but I think um, a good practice I've been trying to you know, be cognizant of while I'm searching for news is looking for unbiased sources where I feel like the tone of these articles are more to educate me rather than persuade me to believe this or that. But I think there is a larger problem in that a lot of publications are putting paywall paywalls to their content and the fact that we're discouraged from, you know, seeking publications that we might want to align with and hear more from, but are, are you know, kind of hindered from that from a financial standpoint and that kind of like brings me to a larger question as if you know news is even a commodity because at the end of the day news is a service you know to inform us just as you know you'd go to a restaurant to pay for food and the services for them to give you that but with news trying to inform us should there be a price to wanting to be informed and I think that you know just speaks to a larger question that I open up to any of the panelists in the sense that should there be a price for just wanting to know more um 
and that opens up larger conversations of digital equity and so on and so forth. But just something I've been thinking about, you know, with the track of this, um, you know, dialogue and conversation. Sure. Does anybody want to take that one? I mean, that, like, it's funny to hear you say that because like, that's my reaction is like, that's crazy. You don't like not to pay for news. Like, I mean, it's, and it's like, it's just how the sort of lens has shifted on that. Like where the, the sort of, it's like, why should I be paying for this thing that should be free? Right, essentially is a, um, that is quite a shift in from the time I, you know, I started out in my career. I, I will say, oh, go, no, go on. Bad, Dean Jackson. I, I was going to say, I, I'm, I'm thinking of some of the arguments made by um, a few of my colleagues at the Annenberg School. And I think there's a version of what um, I think Kayla is asking us to think about and, and that David's responding to. That really is a question about how much we want to tether um, this, what Kayla called the service of news, the fourth estate, to the marketplace. So clearly there's a role there but should it all be reducible to, to that? And in the context where, you know, what some might call surveillance capitalism, and we're all implicit in our own surveillance in a social media moment in a lot of ways, and the kind of panoptic sorting, um, as one of my former colleagues would have said, of all of us, the datafication of human identity with all of this new technology. I think there's a question to be said for the role of something other than the market to regulate that. Which isn't to say the market doesn't have a place, but I, but I buy the argument that says this is also a public good and a public service. And as such, we should at least think about ways of expanding our assumptions about how people get access to this material, about the ways in which we structure the institution of news and of media more generally. And that that stuff is about more than simply whether or not we think there's something good or bad about a particular platform, but also about how we want to imagine we're going to build a democracy that can accommodate this radically changing media ecology in a way that isn't simply going to be about whether or not people are going to be willing to pay to get, get the information we know they need to be informed members of the body politic. And another part of that is how are people going to become literate consumers of the news to the extent of being able to disaggregate fact from fiction and you know, conspiracy theories. Uh, this comes to mind when I think of January 6th and of this last campaign and the post-election period, the, uh, which is not the marketplace so much as the information that people are absorbing by, by their own selection tends to be feeding their, whatever their perceptions, their biases are and for so many people to believe that the election was not a valid election, which is reinforced, of course, by you know, the president and by all of the uh, members of the, uh, the House and Senate propagating that, but for people to buy into all these conspiracy theories, for people whom we would interview along the way and at the rallies to say, well, this is just not true, you're wrong. You know, the, the election wasn't decided. He really did win. He is really going to come back. You know all the the, the myths about March fourth, and he's going to come back and and be, you know, coronated. Um, I my concern in with social media is first of all the accessibility of it, and especially during the pandemic, what it's meant for, you know, primary school education. Uh, in particular, also obviously higher education, but the lack of broadband access, the way this has fed into the lack of equity uh, that exists in public education, especially in, well, not only urban centers, rural centers, and on, you know, in, in all kinds of places in this country, but the lack, lack of access to um, broadband, to the digital divide has become you know, a life and death issue for people, not just their education, but their access to information about healthcare, about COVID. And at the same time, I don't know how people are, are feeding, are being fed by all of these conspiracy theories and absorbing all of this through social media. So I can't get my, my head around the role of social media in creating 
a better educated society and a society that has access those who can't pay for it as well as a new generation that is not necessarily aware of what is fact based and what isn't and what does that what does that mean for decision making in in our political um, system on issues like immigration and gun laws and uh, reproductive rights and the really controversial cultural issues if they can't get facts and they don't know where to even find them. And so that's sort of a jumble of things that are really concerning me about the social media aspects of this. So what so what I heard Kayla say is that journalists, and I, I mean, I'll, I'll always do one at heart, uh, maybe we haven't made our case to a generation that, that wants the news to be free or possibly even very highly curated to their individual political worldview. Um, and fundamentally, that's also a business question. And it, and it gets to that social equity piece of our conversation today. Um, newsrooms are under siege right now for lack of diversity. What stories aren't being told? What stories are being told through a distorted lens because of the lack of absence of brown and black journalists doing the stories, running the newsrooms, um, is, a, is a business model self-correction uh, going to have to go hand in hand with convincing the Kalas of the world that, that there is true and intrinsic value in the product of receiving the news and of the, receiving information? Yeah. I mean, I think that there's a, a, you know, a space for people to, you know, you know, grow, I guess you could say within the business where they, you know, I, people like me are saying like, well, I'm would like to cover race, social equity, uh, social justice, all these different things that maybe uh, newspapers may or magazines may not have been previously inclined to focus upon. But the key has been, frankly, the people themselves have shown us what the stories are. I mean, the, you know, you've seen things like that last summer, this uprising that comes out of uh, not merely the George Floyd killing, but, you know, a long history of animus between the police and our communities. And that, you know, any, any newspaper or publication or network is going to want to know how to cover that story properly. And what they've had to realize through negative experiences and a lot of negative press, unfortunately, for them is that it pays to have people who have lived experience in these areas. It pays to have people who understand what it's like to be harassed by a police officer, who understand what it's like to uh, see their, their family uh, evicted, who know what it's like to live in a community where the, the water is poisoned by lead and other contaminants. I mean, this is something that, you know, our media, because of the gatekeeping that has been going on throughout the decades, has not had at the level on which it currently has. It. So it, it encourages specialization, it encourages people to say, okay, I wanna read this person or I wanna watch this show. What we need to do, I think, as a business is, under, is incentivize, um, you know, basically a little broader scope on what exactly is happening. And so that we can you know, try to, and also incentivize finding other revenue streams besides subscriptions and in, in things that you know, come directly from the consumers. Um, on another point though, um, I, I wanted to make sure I mentioned that you know, when it comes to social media, I mean, that is a job for our politicians to regulate, frankly, these companies that are you know, a little bit out of control. Uh, and I think it's, that's my personal opinion, but I do think that it, that means that it is incumbent upon us as citizens to pressure our you know our elected representatives to take a take a role in this because those companies whether or not they would like to admit it and I talk with some of them and they don't like to admit it they are media companies as well and they need to understand how what they do or don't do is impacting um, our understanding of the very you know facts that we're trying to get out to the people. What else? I guess all, all I would, I mean, it's been very useful to hear folks um, respond to Kayla's uh, prompt. You know, there's a version of what I think is new about, the, I mean, there are many things I think that are emergent 
um, and relatively new about our current moment. But to just harken back to something um, Andrea Mitchell said earlier, you know, there is a difference between a moment when, say, you have three networks that might have slightly different programming in the nightly news, but um, and, and are doing a version of what um, has already been called agenda setting, a gatekeeping. Um, that means your job really is to just assimilate the information. Whereas I think increasingly, and this is a good thing, not just a bad thing. Increasingly, your role is to adjudicate between different kinds of ways of understanding the information. And that's in some way a very different educational project than what we've had to do in the past. So it's not just, well, what are the facts? Give them to me so I can learn them. My job is now also to, from the very beginning, decide which facts are the ones that are gonna make sense, actually even understand the facts that aren't right because I need to know where those come from and why people believe them. Even if my goal is to ultimately try to convince them otherwise, maybe especially if that's my goal. And so I think there's, there's a version of what we're trying to deal with now that's such a more complicated way of understanding what, this, what education should entail in the 21st century, given how much access we have. This ubiquitous, unending stream of information. And I think you see that in how public schools are beginning to recalibrate their approach to what students, what critical education needs to be. And I think, and I'll end by simply saying, I always try to go back to the same core idea, which is we come to any piece of evidence, any news article, any book, any film with a set of assumptions, with an ideological perspective and position. The most critical thing you can always be on the hunt for are ways to deconstruct and challenge what you think you take for granted about the world. It's easy to do that with other people and what they believe. But to the extent that you can be really purposeful about challenging some of what you take for granted, what you even treat most preciously, is I think one of the skills we need to be able to encourage among students and among the general population uh, overall. Because I think if we can't find a way to recognize that it's in our best interest to reconsider our positions, it's in our best interest to reimagine some of what we believe and take for granted, then we're always gonna be stuck. And we're never gonna be open, even if the knowledge is there, to being able to assimilate that into our mindset in the ways in which we approach uh, you know, future situations and dilemmas. Oh, well, that, that brings me to a question that I, I would love to hear from, from all of you about how you go about seeking out content that challenges your beliefs and assumptions, maybe that rattles you to the core, uh, that is upsetting in different ways that may be um, the antithesis of, of mainstream. And what's the value in that? Because there are, there are many who would then say, we're just endorsing the move toward entire opinion-based coverage as opposed to the lines that were very clearly drawn when, when Andrea started, when I started, when Jamil started, the lines have been blurred and they're gonna to continue to be blurred, but how and where do you go and how often do you, do you search out this, this kind of content that, is, that, that rattles you and that makes you shake your head, but that ultimately is hopefully informative in how you approach the work that you do. I can speak a little bit about the sideline post and how we've encouraged ourselves to kind of put out content that might challenge some other people, especially fellow college athletes to think about their own personal experiences or how I like Dean Jackson said to really be cognizant of what we take for granted of in our privilege and, and different experiences. I think the beauty of sports, especially as it's evolved, is that it is a very diverse environment as opposed to a lot of different settings. But I think as a young person, you kind of are at times really oblivious that not everyone experiences the same thing you are. And so I also think that because we're young people, we also think other young people aren't, you know, going through the same kind of trials and tribulations that you might experience as an adult, when that is really not true. For the sideline post, we put out several articles about, you know, college athletes already having dealt with racism within their sports and within their lives. And I think that challenges readers, especially um, just this demographic that, you know, things are happening at a young age and we need to be cognizant of 
not only that they're happening, but the privilege that we hold that we don't have to experience these things sometimes, but to be aware and to be empathetic, I think, is really what is needed right now, especially for a younger demographic, um, to kind of step outside of yourself and be aware of what's happening. So I think the sideline post has really done our best to put out those kinds of articles to challenge others to think about their own experiences and their own lives. And, and if I may, Monica, I think part of our job, a big part of our job is to try to shake our readers, viewers, and listeners out of their uh, complacency. And I think about what if there were no bystander taking the video for nine and a half minutes of George Floyd? Would the BLM movement have um, captured the imagination and the support of the country, of mainstream America the way it did? Because black men and, and youths and black women for that matter, Breonna Taylor, have been uh, you know, killed, treated unfairly, by authorities, by police, and in other, other ways for centuries now in this country. And if there hadn't been the earliest film crews from network television on the Edmund Pettus Bridge watching the treatment on Bloody Sunday, would the civil rights movement leading to the Voting Rights Act, which has now been you know, being destroyed in 43 states, state legislatures who are right now voting to take it apart piece by piece, after the 2013 decision by the Supreme Court, you know, took out a big part of it, but um, parenthetically, but if we weren't there then, my predecessors, when I was still in school, you know, would that have led to the Kennedys finally letting Dr. King after the march and then finally um, well, not that because it was now LBJ, would they have then embraced the civil rights movement and gotten those laws passed? So the iPhone is now the best, you know, iPhone phone video is now the best weapon in trying to protect people around the world. And so part of our job is to bring these stories to people and do enough reading to and enough learning and enough interviewing to learn these issues deeply and then get them on the air and that's sometimes a big challenge but right now you know my particular passion is these voting rights issues because i think that that will determine all of the future elections and 43 states is a very big deal and if those states if we don't have a, a national law because of the gridlock in Congress, and if those state legislatures do what they're about to do, um, from Georgia now, Iowa, Arizona, you know, I don't have to rattle them all off. So we need to shake, have enough facts at our command to get our producers or editors to listen to us and get these stories into onto our platforms. And that's what I think is a big part of my job now is to not only learn these issues, but to use whatever seniority I have right now to, to get people to pay attention. Well, and, and I'm curious, is that is that also an imperative for, for David and Jamil? Um, I mean, given the decimation of, of local and, and state house coverage across the country, the national media may be the only outlet that tell these stories. You're not going to get it in your hometown. You're not going to get it at your in your at the local level. And people, I mean, when you think about just the the shrinkage across the industry, how do you do you feel an imperative to tell those stories from the perch that you have? Certainly. I, I, one of the things I think that's also really important as we consider this problem is geographic diversity and the lack thereof. You know, we talk a lot about racial and, and gender diversity, and, and that's important. Obviously, we can get back to that, but it's important that people who work for national outlets don't just live in New York. They don't just live here in Los Angeles. They don't just live in D.C. And when we get out of these bubbles, even if we're not from them originally, we get out of them to actually see what is going on in the world, to talk to people, to have sources, you know, that are in stories that are more localized. 
we have to essentially be the local paper, uh, you know, for a lot of people. And that's a really unfortunate development, but not one that we as individual journalists can control. What we can control is how we cover stories and whether we, not we meet people where they are. If they can't subscribe to my, ma you know, my magazine or, or to, they can't get cable to see Andrea, or they, you know, that is, we have to find places where we can meet them. You know, if they have a phone, they can get podcasts. If, um, if there's some kind of way we can get to them on Twitter or other uh, social media outlets, then we should do that. We, it's our responsibility to define them so that we can get this information out because we are experiencing, as Dean mentioned, a crisis of facts in this country. You know, people are choosing their own facts, uh, frankly, because they have the capability to do so. And so, and when we have these kinds of you know, problems within the business, um, you know, I think we're too busy trying to fend off the nonsense, uh, you know, in order to form an effective strategy. So I think we, we just start to concentrate a little bit more on that. And I think, frankly, with this new administration, we'll have an opportunity to. Uh, we'll, uh, hopefully things can improve. David? Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure, like, how much, I mean, how much so many of our problems are not from that decline of local news that you just described. Um, I mean, if you think of a country where there were every you know, mid-sized city had their own newspaper that was robust and active, and we're now almost like very few do, and that that's been replaced by you know, essentially social media, and, and which has no standards of anything um, often. And that, I mean, it seems as if kind of relating back to what we were talking earlier, like you could imagine that, that that's sort of an easy problem to solve. Like if that's our problem that you have, giant tech companies decimating local newsrooms and kind of I mean, stealing their content and putting it for free in front of people, well, like we can just kind of fix that problem. Um, but, but you know, I just wanted to, what you're talking about sort of stories that have like shook us to our, our core earlier. And, you know, as, as journalists, I think like we, we, and it's this competitive, you know, with your colleagues, it's like, we shouldn't like be reading stories that take us to our core. We should be like talking to people and hearing their stories and have those shake us to our core. It really relates back to what uh, Jamil is saying about you know, newsroom diversity and also the kind of clustering of newsrooms and journalists around the coasts. Um, you know, when something like the, this, this summer protest happens, it, it seems like really, and also like the sort of gatekeeping function that Jamil described earlier, like it seems really damning that that is like a surprise to, to many news hyper uh, aware news consumers and even journalists. Like we should have kind of been aware of that and it shouldn't have taken a video that there's something out there in the country happening. And people are really angry about all th this dynamic, you know, with communities of color and the police. And I think that you see the sort of problems of newsroom diversity and the problems of this sort of, you know, coastal national media replacing the rest of the media in that kind of like, what, what's happening here? But how, where did all this come from? Like, because it didn't just snap its finger, there was a video and now people are angry. Like all that anger was already there. Interesting. And, um, and the thing is, just to add real quick on that, a lot of us knew about it. <laughs> a lot of us did know about it because we've experienced it yeah. firsthand. Right. And there's just not enough of us. Right. And, you know, we don't, we don't have, a, a, you know, we're not in, in the masthead on these magazines. We're not at senior leadership at networks and in other publications. And we're not being, we weren't listened to for a long time. And all of a sudden it hits the fan and wait, oh, wait, can you go cover? Yeah, I could have been covering that three years ago. Yeah. We could have had a show about this four years ago, you know, or where there was a show about this 10 years ago. And we've been talking about it this whole time and you haven't been listening. This is, you know, it's not simply, you know, folks who um, are outside of the press who haven't been thinking critically about these issues and folks, frankly, that are inside and have, you know, hold too much power. So, so Kayla, as, as we get closer to, to the end of this, um, I would be absolutely remiss if I didn't ask, does, does having this conversation, does doing the work on the, that you're doing with the Sideline Post make you think that you might want to pursue a life and a career in, in journalism. Um, it's the weight of the world on the shoulders, obviously, but there, I mean, it is, it is clear that we need a, a generation, a very a diverse and brilliant and engaged generation to want to take this up on behalf of the democracy, on behalf of our country. And 
I, I honestly don't know if it's a remotely attractive career option nowadays for uh, uh, an energetic college student like yourself. Yeah, I mean, just to, as context, my starting of the Silent Post was in no way formed or influenced because I wanted to further myself and put, you know, having a journalism experience on my resume. It was born out of a pure passion to kind of give a voice to a demographic I thought needed more exposure. And it still will be the, you know, founding, you know, mission for the Silent Post. But, you know, getting to be a part of this conversation, one, but also kind of being a part of the process of allowing such a diverse population of people to share their stories and um, creating even more diversity in the type of college athlete voice that is heard, it's definitely sparked my interest. Um, I'm in the business school here, so I think it'd be a great opportunity to kind of pair in, an interest in journalism, but also kind of thinking about how business models in that regard can intersect, I think would be a cool opportunity. But yeah, it's definitely sparked my interest a lot more. Well, and, I, and I'm curious, especially for, for Jamil and David, um, uh, how, how do we pitch this to, to the next generation? Uh, how do you make that pitch? Is it more about the blending of advocacy and, and truth telling? Is it more about um, you know, the lines that, that couldn't be crossed when I started in the, in the business that are kind of being blurred more now? How, how do we get the Kalas of, of the universe to, to see the imperative and the opportunity? Jimmy, you want to go? Yeah, yeah, I'll go. Start, I'll start. I mean, first of all, real. Uh, I think what we can do, it, it may sound odd given the context of all the things we've discussed, but journalism is a lot of fun. I, I, will, I really enjoy this career. I enjoy reporting. I, it's, it's one of the only professions uh, beyond academia that encourages you and, pages, and pays you to learn. That's exactly what we do all day is we learn and we decipher, we're, we're probing. And if, if you have a curious mind, and you are not necessarily one of these folks who's in, you know, out here trying to lead protest movements or run an organization, maybe press is exactly where you need to be. You know, you have, you have a curious mind and you are trying to dig and trying to find the truths and trying to understand the world around you. Uh, journalism, I can't really think of too many careers that are better for that, uh, if that is in, indeed your inclination. Uh. Yeah, I, I mean, I just, I just couldn't agree further. I mean, couldn't agree more. I mean, it's, um, it's like, uh, and I, you know, I know this conversation can be sort of cranky, like old people yelling about Facebook sometimes, but like, I mean, it's, a, it's a complete privilege every day. I, I, you know, you have to kind of pitch yourself. I mean, as Jamal just said, you like you get to learn and talk to people and like read things and newspapers and um, write. I mean, it's, um, it's, it'll like, obviously, as you've heard, you know, rip your soul out bit by bit. Um, but uh, that said, like, it's, it's like, it's, it's really, um, I mean, it's, it's the life of Kings. It really is. So we're, yeah, go ahead, Andrea. I just want to say to that, Kayla, it is the adventure of a lifetime and every day, um, is a different unfolding story. You're telling stories, you're communicating. And until the pandemic, I didn't fully appreciate how much I love to be in the field and running and interviewing people and covering campaigns and going around the world. And of course I've been locked down. We've been in home cameras now for a year uh, and are desperate to get back in the newsroom because I love the energy of my my team, the interns, the producers, my bosses, everybody in the newsroom, a story breaks and you're shouting out, I know that and I know so-and-so and who's got this part of it and you're all together and it's not the same when we're doing conference calls all day and things get lost in the shuffle. Um, just yesterday, I was finally able to bring the story to the, the, the public about these Kurdish women in Syria who organized in 1914 to fight ISIS, they were saving their homeland. And these were women who couldn't play soccer and couldn't choose their own husbands. And suddenly they were arming themselves and getting AK-47s and doing incredible things and managed to defeat ISIS in, in a city called Kobani and then go on. The US Special Forces then linked up with them, gave them air cover. Now they're co-based. They're still fighting to try to keep their, their homeland. Um, from outside forces, not just ISIS, but others 
other hostile neighbors and now have all kinds of choices for themselves, um, including choices of going to school and their, their men folk are giving them newfound respect because they were actually on the front lines. Um, it's just a remarkable story. They, some of them were eight, 18, 19 years old. And the, there's a book, The Daughters of Kobani that are now telling their story. So I was able to interview some of them, but I'm just saying that's the kind of storytelling, if not for the pandemic, I would have been on a plane to meet them in person. I did it by Zoom because we're not allowed just I would say I would now take more chances, uh, not really big chances. Uh, a lot of us older people have been vaccinated now, but um, we're, our companies are not letting us go out and, and do all the things we wanna do. But so I'm really eager to get back to that. But this year has been such an anomaly, but it has also pulled back the scab on so much disparity in healthcare and access in other ways. So there are a lot of new stories to tell. So you bring fresh eyes to it and your generation has the technological skill that ours didn't have. We're just adjusting and learning and trying to keep up. So go to it if you have the adventure, the, the lust for adventure and um, your, your brilliance and your, your other capacity. And what you also have is the, the um, business skills and you know all of that, which I never had. So you're well, the- I have one more question and then uh, we'll, we'll shift uh, a little bit. Um, Dean Jackson, um, as, as the, the, the wise scholar on our, in our midst, um, any final thoughts that you have either sort of for Kayla or the other students? I know there are students, I think my own kids are somewhere in my house watching this, um, about these lofty topics. We're talking about democracy, we're talking about social equity, we're talking about racism, we're talking about this very complicated world that we live in and, using information to try to get closer together rather than to keep pulling ourselves apart. Um, so I guess I would, I would say, first of all, that I'm actually pretty optimistic. Um, I, I look at what's happening on the ground in Philadelphia, I'm trying to work with a group called Resolve Philadelphia that's really thinking through these questions at these different scales it makes me feel like, you know, journalism will continue to evolve. And I, I, I see students at Penn, and I know Penn attracts a certain kind of student, usually with some interest in thinking about the public good, but they're, they're interested in, in trying to help constitute what the future of journalism will be. And I think as the panelists have really done a wonderful job of, of describing here today, you know, journalism is constantly changing. And the version of it that you know, Kayla's generation will produce, I think will be up to the task of dealing with the hectic and crazy informational age um, that they're inheriting. And so I feel like hopefully Kayla will continue to do this kind of work. And, and she's with, I think, a group of young people who are already thinking about ways to understand the flow of information, ways to use new technology that are unprecedented. And that will be a new iteration of what journalism allows us to access as we try to make sure we have an educated populace that can really make decisions for the better of all. And I think that for me is, makes me really you know, optimistic about what's, what's on the horizon. Well, this has been just an extraordinary conversation. We have just a couple minutes left before I uh, hand it off to a couple of my colleagues who are doing exactly what Dean Jackson talked about in terms of their new work in the Office of Social Equity and Community. Um, Andrea, Jamil, Kayla, David, any, any final thoughts that you wanna share as well? I would just say that, you know, Kayla's the future and, and that's the great hope that we have. Uh, to all of the students, um, any of these careers, and there's so many different platforms now and so many different varieties of, of writing and, and reporting, but I think it's fundamental to democracy and to the future of our democracy, which I really do feel has never been more threatened, that more of you become engaged in no matter what form um, of writing and reporting uh, is just, uh, a really wonderful uh, contribution to keeping our country safe and, and improving it, uh, the lives of all of our citizens. And if I may add, um, you know, as much as 
I kind of represent like the younger generation. I think just being on this panel really opens our, my eyes to just the leaders that we already have in place through everyone here. I think, especially within the media, there can be like, obviously as this conversation has described, just a lot of bad things where you think you can't trust, don't know what to trust. Um, but it's nice to have the reassurance that there are leaders like you all here on this panel that are very intentional about doing good work and making sure that these conversations arise and, and that we're being truthful in that. So um, as much as we're the ones who should be uh, on the horizon getting ready for the future, you guys make us hopeful. So we, I appreciate from that from my perspective as well. Well, I just wanna say thank you to everyone for, for spending the time sharing your vision and your wisdom with us. Uh, for everyone who's again watching uh, across the globe uh, or maybe upstairs in my house, I'm not sure. Um, we do have a couple more minutes and I want to make sure that we, we give some time to, to Chaz and his colleagues in the Office of Social Equity and Community. Um, the, the intersection of the work that they're doing and the topics that's discussed today um, are absolutely vital they're vital to Penn, they're vital to Philadelphia, they're vital to the world we live in. And so I would love to have Scott and, and Nicole share a few, few words with all of you, introduce themselves and talk a bit about uh, the tall order that they have signed up for. So take it away. Well, that was indeed uh, a high ceiling, deep well conversation. Uh, what a fantastic inaugural event for Penn's new Office of Social Equity and Community. My name is Scott Filkin. I serve as one of the two directors in the office. Thank you, Dr. Gutman. Uh, thank you, moderator and panelists. Uh, you've taught us. Uh, you've made us better. You've challenged us to ask some hard questions about our own bubbles, privilege, and assumptions. And it was free. Thank you. Most of all, I want to thank those of you who viewed, uh, who came to view today. Uh, we are so grateful for your interest and your participation this afternoon. So thank you as well. Our team is really proud to have brought you this program today. And as a Penn alumna, I'm doubly proud. So hurrah for the red and blue. My name is Nicole Malloy. I'm the second director on the team. Special thanks to Chaz for helping make this event possible. And of course, special thanks to President Gutman for her ongoing support. Our office plans to bring similar programming to you in the future. And we also hope to amplify other voices and stories from throughout the Penn community. So with that in mind, and with the caveat that our website and social media accounts are new, and still being developed, please visit us at www.sec.upenn.edu and also look for us on both Instagram and Facebook at Social Equity at Penn or on Twitter at SEC Penn. On behalf of Penn's Office of Social Equity and Community, Chaz, Mercedes, Scott, and myself, be well, take care of yourselves and others, and have a wonderful spring. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much. Chaz, anything final from you? Thanks, everybody. Take care.